Welcome to the stage, Salesforce AI CEO Clara Shai with Cerebral Valley co-host Eric Newcomer. I'm back, Clara. Thanks for being here with me. Great to be here. CEO of Salesforce AI, can you explain that a little bit for us? What is your role at Salesforce? Well, it changes by the day, <laughs> but um, basically seven, eight months ago, we saw everything that was happening with ChatGPT and customer demand, and we, we came together as a leadership team. I was running Salesforce Service Cloud at the time, which is our portfolio of customer service technologies, and we said, look, there's all these AI efforts that are happening in each cloud, in Service Cloud, in Sales Cloud, in Marketing Cloud, in Slack, in MuleSoft, in, in Tableau, on the platform team. We really need to come together and take a platform approach so that we're not building you know, multiple different RAG systems, multiple different um, data clouds. Right? We, ha we have to have one strategy to really drive every part of Salesforce and also for our whole ecosystem. You know, I, I feel like with this conference, we sort of jump into it with the premise that you know, AI is super important and this has sort of been a huge revolution, but you're out talking to customers and sort of communicating to the world about what's happening. Can you just take a moment to sort of, in your view, like what has transpired over the last two years that has gotten everyone so excited, including Salesforce and your customers, uh, that you need sort of a CEO of AI at a company? I mean, I, Salesforce is really great, right? Because Salesforce, I think a lot of you guys know this, they, Salesforce Research 10 years ago published and open source some of the earliest large language models and have been very open in the community and in contributing. Of course, they didn't really get good until more recently. And so I think having that foundation of technology and talent has been a huge asset for us. Right, it's not all new. Some, some yeah. of the stuff, you know, DeepMind was founded like 2010, OpenAI, I think it was like 2015. You know, there's been a lot of work leading up to this sort of manic period. That's right, I think what is new at Salesforce though is that our Salesforce research team, we now might work much more closely together, right? We, we talk daily. And and it really feels like one team versus looking many, many years out, which they still do, but they have a lot more near-term projects that we're working on together. But in terms of what customers are saying, you know, first we're seeing a huge surge in demand for our existing predictive AI capabilities. Salesforce Einstein, which is what we launched our predictive AI seven years ago, it's things like sales forecasting, um, next best actions for contact center reps. Um, we're seeing huge adoption of those, just as companies, large and small, have awareness around AI. And then certainly on the generative AI space, a lot of companies have said, look, we feel overwhelmed, right? The McKinsey report tells us that there's going to be $4 trillion in economic value, but where do we start? We can't do everything everywhere all at once. Like, we have to start with specific use cases. And when you look at where companies have operational bottlenecks, where they want to take out cost, where productivity is a real issue, it's oftentimes it's the customer support team, it's the sales team, it's the marketing team, it's admins. Like think about the backlog of requests that companies have to even update their Salesforce instance. So that's really where we started was, was bringing those turnkey features into the flow of work. And now on top of that, we're building the platform. Do you, you have a sense, like how much is it sort of the CEO or some leader at the company saying, we need AI somewhere in our company versus, yeah, we have a problem with like customer support and we should be much better and we're gonna flow that way. I assume you you hear both. Like, but what is sort of the top-down enthusiasm from big sort of normal non-tech public companies in terms of embracing AI is just a thing that they should be doing at the moment. Like it is like there's so much hype, right? We're just like coming <laughs> off of the, the peak of the hype cycle, which I think is great for many of us in this room if we can deliver. And so yes, every CEO, every board of directors, they've made this a top three mandate. And so then once they have the mandate, now they, they then they ask, well now what? What do we do? Right? Do we just do we fine tune a model? Do we train a model? Do we use one of these foundational model APIs? What's the use case we point this at? How do we do this in a data secure way? Think given data privacy, not just from a regulatory standpoint and data residency standpoint and not just within not just making sure that data doesn't leak out of a company but within companies different departments and users have different sharing rules and data permissions and so that's very top of mind for these companies as they roll out these use cases is which department can I unlock the biggest bottlenecks and an ROI and number two very like tied is how do I do it safely and securely are people able to use open source projects llama or whatever if you're sort of paranoid about security or does that sort of thinking lead you to an open AI or some sort of closed system 
I think the, the thought on large language models, whether they're foundational models or open source, that I'm hearing from customers is they're like, look, it's trained on the same stuff, right? It's, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's good. There's also a lot of stuff that's, that's not great. It's bias. It's toxic. So we have to solve for it. We have to, and this is why I think a lot of companies have been, have been working with Salesforce, is our Einstein, we call it our Einstein trust layer. But basically, it's a number of, of features from toxicity filters to data masking to citations that kind of like assume that the model's pre-training is going to be on a lot of good and bad stuff. And then we compensate for that with all those checks and filters as well as really good rag. In this customer support use case, how much are you seeing you know, Salesforce's AI tools powering humans who are answering the questions versus yielding totally to the AI? And how do you see that trajectory sort of moving over the next couple of years? It's such an important question. I mean, it's, it's the question of, of jobs and the role of, of service reps. I'm seeing both, but mo more companies are starting with a human in the loop, kind of understandably, to the point earlier about trust. And recognizing that good AI is contingent on having really good data, both a comprehensive view of data across structured and unstructured data, as well as recognizing when there's conflicts, being able to, to address those conflicts, recognizing when there's gaps in data and being able to address those so that you can provide the, the proper grounding for the models. Uh, one of my favorite stories is, is Gucci, you know, the Italian designer. Um, our research team and I started working with them two and a half years ago. They came to, they flew out from Milan to visit us in San Francisco. And I do love the, like, we're a clothing company. We, like, we need the AI. In, yeah. Well, they didn't come in saying right. that they needed AI. They came in with a business problem, like you were saying earlier, saying, hey, it's been COVID. Like every other business, we've had a lot of turnover in our contact centers. We have a lot of new people that we're hiring. We can't just unleash them on our customer. We have a very high end customer that has very high expectations. Can you help us? And as we, throughout the course of the day, we realized that we could use Salesforce Research's large language models, this is like pre-chat GPT, by over a year, to, to potentially help. So we ran this experiment, we built a prototype for them, and you know, as the models got better and we, we plugged in different models for different use cases, we found that we actually could make these service reps really productive much faster than if they went through the traditional training that you would have to to become a, a high functioning service representative. So much so that now their service reps, you know, they're able to address the customer support issue very quickly, but then they're pivoting to having a, a deeper customer relationship. Sales, or? sales. So because it's the whole Salesforce customer 360, they're gonna they'll say, oh Eric, I addressed your issue with your you know broken belt buckle that you bought 50 years ago. Um, now I see that in your e-commerce cart, you also have a handbag. Is that a gift? Is that for yourself? And then they're having those conversations, and they're becoming, you know, aided by AI. They're becoming sellers and really unlocking new careers. You know, the argument against sort of human in the loop is that basically you're adding the cost of AI, and you have the human workforce already. Like, how how much are companies saving money, or what's is it just about the quality of service, or how do you sell them on? paying for a new technology while keeping the humans. I mean, you, can make, you make the humans much more productive, and right. that comes in the form of both time saving, so the average handle time of customers using service GPT, which is our out-of-the-box customer service use cases, so things like suggested reply recommendations and case summaries at the end of, of a case, you're saving time, right? So the, the service reps are able to do more. And then in the case of companies like Gucci, the service reps are actually driving the top line as well, right? They're now becoming sellers and in increasing the, the basket conversion rate on e-commerce and really helping drive revenue. I wanted to talk about Slack for a second because it's such a comprehensible sort of use case of AI. I feel like there's this dream right now that you're chatting away and then you know, you get, you're able to search it, for example, really easily. Maybe it comes up with sort of information, like, oh, you're typing about this, like, prompt us on that. Okay, so there, that vision, I think that's an intuition people have. And there are a lot of companies running at that, right? There are, you know, there's Glean right now that wants to plug, that plugs in with Slack, plugs in with other things and says, okay, we're gonna be neutral across all these different companies. Then you have Microsoft, which is like, you're gonna live in our world and we're gonna provide that if you exist within sort of the world of Microsoft. Yeah, how, how do you see that playing out, sort of talking through what's what's happening with Slack? Slack is an incredible asset. It was an incredible asset before this Gen AI craze, and it's, it's doubly exponentially so now. I mean, you think about Slack, it's really 
an organization's brain. It's where all of the tacit, a lot of the tacit knowledge lives. Of course, you can't just use it out of the box, right? It has to be mined for insights, just like any conversation transcript, whether it's a phone call or a Slack conversation, you, can, you have to mine it to, to pull out that tacit knowledge. But once you have that, that can be incredibly powerful, both for training and fine tuning, as well as to use for, um, the, for the semantic search. And then beyond that, Slack as a user interface is incredible. Right? You think about you know, whether it's ChatGPT or BARD or so many of these tools, they're kind of single player experiences. Slack creates that natural language conversation for multiplayer. And you can add people in at any given time. And, and together, you can kind of like partner as a team with the AI agent or multiple AI agents. So it's an st extremely strategic asset for us, and I work very closely with the Slack team. And how do you think about interoperability? Or do you want to own Slack's Gen AI stack, or are you OK saying Slack's super valuable and we make Slack better by letting people, pl other companies plug in and try and enhance its feature set? I think that the latter is, is it's, I mean, that's the reality of, of any enterprise company today is that they're going to have Slack. They're going to have either Teams or Zoom to do video calls, right? They're going to they're going to have a lot of different, so we have an open architecture approach. We've, we've done this on the application layer. I think mean, Salesforce is a very much a platform company. And we've also done this on the model layer, right? Salesforce research has tremendous models, whether it's it's CoGen or ProGen or um, any of these uh, Blip2, right, multimodal models. But we also have an open model architecture where you can choose to use Palm 2. You can choose to use any of the open AI APIs. You can bring your own. You can fine tune your own. It's like it's really up to the customer. The, the sort of partnership between open AI and Microsoft, how much do you see that sort of as a threat, something you need to respond to? Does it make it hard to work with open AI? Have you been able to sort of integrate them pretty seamlessly? We're great partners with OpenAI. I mean, there has no, their partnership with Microsoft or others has no impact on us. We were part of their launch at, at Dev Day, and um, it's, it's a really great partnership. And we, where we have joint customers or where customers want to use OpenAI versus one of the other options, we are, we are completely partnering on their success. I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the policy questions and just, I mean, the Biden executive order is looming large, I think going to loom large today. Like, has Salesforce really staked out a position either way on regulation of AI. I know that you know, trust is so important to the Salesforce brand. You, you know, being a good actor genuinely is such a big part of the pitch and brand of Salesforce. How do you apply that reputation to everything that's going on in AI right now? It's a great question. I mean, we're, we're heavily involved. We've been engaged with the, the Biden administration for many months. We were part of the initial set of voluntary commitments that led to the recent executive order. We're also doing that on, an, on a global basis. So we, we have, we've had a number of meetings this week with, as yeah, part of the Apex It's easy to be over-focused on the United States, but uh, yeah. Sorry yeah, I mean, interrupt. just this week, right, we've got a global delegation, um, the Apex Summit here in San Francisco. So it's, it's very much top of mind for us. And so much of it is around education and engagement with policymakers um, on both sides of the aisle and just helping and driving awareness of what these models are capable of. And, and to your point, right, Salesforce, our number one value is trust. And it's both because everybody in the company believes it's the right thing to do, especially when you have a technology as powerful as these large language models. But it's also good business because that's trust is why enterprise companies come to Salesforce. But does trust mean regulation to you or how much do you want sort of, you know, your, part of the strategy is to partner with lots of different companies, including open source. Yeah, how much have you been sort of pro-regulation so far? I think there is some amount of, I mean, on this, from a speaking for Salesforce, but all, and also me personally, some amount of regulation is needed. And I think the, the executive, the, the, sorry, the White House order, I really touched on a lot of smart things. So I thought it was, it was very well done. We thought it was very well done. Um, of course, regulation alone doesn't deliver trust. Right? Ultimately, trust is, is in the, actual, the actions of leaders and technology, of customers. And so that's why we've, been very, we've tried to be very open about you know, our trust layer, both the policy and the principles. We've open sourced our, our ethical AI, secure AI principles, and also the technology. We were very open about what we believe are the, the key ingredients for a trust layer for AI, because we really think that everybody should, should operate that way. Just looking forward to next year, I'm curious, any predictions or what you're excited about? I mean, we sort of alluded to the idea that are we at the peak of the hype cycle, especially in terms of 
sort of typical company excitement and adoption? Like, where do you see sort of all this excitement playing out next year? Yeah, so I see a lot of companies, like, they get really excited. They've issued these board-level CEO mandates, and then they take a, an LLM, either an API or an open source one that they fine tune, and then they slap it on their data, and then they unleash it to all their employees, and they're like, great, we have ChatGPT for enterprise, and they find out very quickly that it doesn't work, right? There's a high hallucination rate because the data ducks aren't in a row, and so I think, this, I mean, we've also seen tremendous, tremendous demand for our data cloud for this reason, right? They're realizing, okay, I need to have a data strategy before I can have a successful AI strategy. I need to capture all the structured and unstructured data in my company. I need to pre-process a lot of it. And then, and only then, can I use that, right? And I need to use all the metadata about the data um, to be able to, to guide my AI. So where do I th see this going next year? You know, right now we have customers using service GPT, sales GPT, marketing GPT. So all these in the flow of work turnkey use cases, these are prompt templates that were created by Salesforce product managers. Customers are using those. They're asking for more. They want to customize them and create their own. So next year in, in February, we're going we're to GA our co-pilot studio where they can take any existing prompt template, such as for a service reply recommendation. They can make it their own. They can ground it in their Salesforce data graph because right, everyone has their own custom fields and objects inside of Salesforce or outside of Salesforce in data cloud. And then they want to be able to um, go beyond basic question, question answering to actioning and decisioning and being able to leverage all the workflows that they've built in Salesforce over the last 20 years and empowering the co-pilot for employees and co-pilot for customers to access those workflows and really um, drive much more automation. How, how does investing fit into the Salesforce strategy? I mean, you, you all have been pretty active in this space. Is that going to continue and is it about Finding partners, is it just for a return on capital, or how do you think about the investing strategy? It's critical. I mean, you can really think of Salesforce, our AI strategy, as three legs of a stool. We've got our R&D, like our typical product development, everything I've been talking about so far. We have our research group, which I mentioned, right? They've been developing a lot of large language models, but they've also been developing small models and domain-specific models and industry-specific models and custom embeddings models. And there's all kinds of really interesting things that they're doing that we're bringing to market. And then the third leg of the stool is our ventures team. And our ventures team, we, we want to build a, and cultivate a really great ecosystem. The App Exchange has always been kind of a, a driving force for Salesforce pre-AI. And as we evolve the App Exchange, we want Salesforce to be the platform that developers and ISVs really come to so that they don't have to build their own trust layer. They don't have to build their own um, ethical set of policies, but they can really, you can really focus on, on innovation. And so the ventures team, we've been investing at every layer of the stack. We've invested in Anthropic and Cohere, um, on the applications layer, Typeface, Runway, um, a number of different really exciting companies that are now part of our ecosystem. Claire Shai, thank you so much for joining me here. Thanks. Oh,